Good evening, all. Um, I'm sorry for this little delay in, in our today's lecture. It was due to some technical uh, difficulties, but uh, thanks to my colleagues, it's all improved now and I guess there is no problem. Uh, can I please, uh, at the very beginning, ask uh, if, you can, if you can hear me well? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll try to be very brief explaining the, uh, the content uh, and make a, an outline, outline of what we are going to uh, study as part of, of this uh, course. First of all, I wanted to share the information that this is a course which is hosted by uh, uh, Marina Tuneva, which is me. I'm a professor at the School of Journalism and Public Relations in Macedonia. Then my colleague Pina Raslan, uh, who is a PhD candidate and a researcher at the Istanbul University in Turkey, Turkey. and my colleague Mia Misha, uh, Master of Science lecturer at the Dobay Faculty uh, in Slovenia. Uh, briefly about the objectives of this course. First of all, uh, our idea is uh, to get familiar with the concept of intercultural communication and to become a more interculturally communicative person, thus compete in the ever-changing and expanding global market. It's been quite challenging and interesting for us to work on uh, this course, on the content of this course, and we try to compile um, information, get facts on how these courses are organized throughout universities in, in Europe. Thus, we hope that the program that we offer here is um, uh, is uh, very um, comprehensive and that we are up to date with the news, newest trends in teaching of these kinds of uh, courses. The second objective of the course is to enab enable understanding of the culture as a dynamic process we go through in order to communicate successfully across cultures. Cultural complexities in different contexts will be analyzed and discussed aimed at developing your own intercultural awareness and skills. How is this course organized? A big portion of the course is very practical, which means that uh, you uh, have uh, opportunities to work in assignments, something that is well known to you. The way of organizing the assignments, the way of uh, doing this is uh, something that it's uh, that it's very um, acceptable as a way of teaching the course and uh, uh, my colleagues uh, who already worked with you share the information that you are quite an ent in a group of ent enthusiastic people very motivated to take part in uh, in the in in this kind of practical learning so you will prepare individual assignments as well as team assignments and submit, submit them on a weekly level. This course is organized in three weeks, containing three webinars and assignments each week. Uh, you already know the fact and some of you uh, got in touch with us today about the uh, teams uh, who are uh, who are established and if you have some questions regarding the teams or if you have some difficult difficulties in, in, in organizing uh, as a team can you can, you can please uh, contact us and um, get support from the from the school you also have forums avail available where you can uh, ask questions about uh, about this issue um, let me briefly explain you um, the assignments that you have. In the first week, um, you have individual and team assignment. In the second week, two assignments, one of which is teamwork and the other one is both individual and teamwork. The third week, you have only one assignment, which is teamwork, I guess it's a role play. And it's quite important, something that you already know, is to make the self-evaluation at the end because it's a basis for us uh, to know how, how much each of you took part in the process of working on the, on the, on the assignments. Um, I will now ask my colleague, Pina Raslan, who is going to continue today with you lecturing uh, for the first week, to uh, briefly present, uh, pre present uh, to, to, to provide an overview of week one, 
Uh, Pinar, can you please hear me? You can you can use this presentation uh, to proceed in in explaining the the, yeah, I, the first week. I can hear you very well. Thank you, and I hope everybody can hear me without problems. Uh, I'll be in a couple of minutes, but I'll just uh, would like to summarize the first week for you. Uh, we'll start with a general introduction, uh, then you mentioned the necessity of intercultural communication, and uh, then uh, we'll talk about Edward T. Hall, who's the founder of the like field of studies, and then we'll also study dimensions of culture about the post data. I hope to see you in a few minutes. And uh, yes, I will just add uh, the information that uh, uh, the for, uh, there are two assignments uh, in this week. Uh, assignment one, me in the intercultural world, uh, which is an individual assignment. The deadline for submission of your assignment is 9th of April, and it's graded 1 to 10 points. While the second assignment is cultural dimensions in different cultures, which is a team assignment, and the deadline for this is 9th of April. It is graded 1 to 20 uh, points. We go to the second week now, and my colleague uh, Mish, Mia Mishi is going to uh, provide you a very brief of, overview of the uh, of this week. Mia, can you please hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Can you can you uh, please explain the the second week? Yes. Hello to all students from Slovenia. We will have in week two two assignment and with both assignments I would like that you use the knowledge from the week one about the cultural dimensions but as well be practical and creative and really share your own knowledge because this is already the exercises that you can help each other and share the knowledge about your culture about how you see the world and I hope as well you will learn a lot from this Please, we work in teams, in teams, and please be very careful with assignment number number four. Because first, a few steps that should be done individual, and the dates are a little earlier because on the basis of your individual work, then you as a team should continue and really finish the assignment. As well, there will be case study on webinar. We will go through some real examples of how to be really cautious in communications in countries where English is not really the first foreign language. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. And we proceed with a very brief explanation about week three uh, from the uh, course. Uh, we talk about intercultural communication and identities as part of this week. Then we talk about critical concepts and barriers in intercultural communication. And here we will more precisely talk about in and out groups, ethnocentrism, stereotypes, prejudices and discrimination, etc. And we also talk about the skills for intercultural communication, either the knowledge that we need to be interculturally competent. The webinar as part of this week is going to be held on the 21st of April and you have one assignment uh, which is actually a role play preparing for a banquet abroad. Um, it's, a kind, it's, a, it's a team assignment and it's graded 1 to 20 points. Uh, this was this would be it in general about the the course contents uh, and as I as I mentioned before we are proceeding with our colleague Pina Raslan but before we proceed with her uh, if you have some questions uh, please uh, please share them with us uh, here and if you don't have questions we'll meet in the during during the third week and of course we are uh, staying in touch about uh, about all the issues related to to this course okay uh, if there are no questions I would uh, kindly ask my colleague Pinner to uh, to proceed with the uh, with the webinar thank you all Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll start with the first week presentation. But Marina, could you please turn off your microphone? I guess. Sure. Okay. I guess it's fine now. 
Uh, if everybody hears me very well, then I'll start with uh, the first week's presentation. But first, I wanted to salute you in person. Okay, and let's start. Okay, I'm sorry, but since there is a presentation already, it's giving me a hard time. Okay, I guess it's happening, yes. So... This is the first week, as you know already, and I'll start with the uh, definition of communication, intercultural communication, and you'll see the very exact term uh, as cross-cultural communication in other books or like, you know, conferences, so they're the same, and it is a field of study that focuses on how people from different cultural backgrounds communicate. It is, uh, okay, yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay, it is, um, I'm sorry, like, it is important to remind that uh, it is an interdisciplinary field and it aims to establish and understand how people from different countries, cultures, or backgrounds communicate with each other. The main aim of the field is to also conduct research about this communication and try to find ways of communicating in this multicultural world of today. Uh, it is the management of messages for the purpose of creating meaning across cultures. This is really important because something means something you know, concrete to a culture, but for another culture, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, basically, the basic uh, aim of intercultural communication is to manage the process. According to Gary Philipson, culture can be defined as a socially constructed and historically transmitted pattern of symbols, meanings, apprentices, and rules. In other words, culture is a code, and different cultures have different codes. In that case, intercultural communication is the study and practice of explaining these cultural codes as correctly as possible to other cultures and managing them within a cultural framework. The first usage of the term intercultural communication credit is often given to American anthropologist Edward T. Hall, whom, uh, who I'm going to mention in a couple of minutes, and he used that, uh, the term intercultural communication for the first time in his book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I tried it, Diane. Okay. Yeah? Is it, is it on now? I hope it is. Okay, so Edward T. Hall used the uh, concept intercultural communication for the first time in his book, The Silent Language, in 1959. The book is sometimes called The Field's Founding Document, so you may, want, you may want to take a look at it as well. Intercultural communication, at least between, uh, occurs at least between two persons from different cultures or microcultures, but in today's world it is like many more people as you may know. A fundamental concept in intercultural communication is context. It refers to the setting, background, and overall framework within which communication occurs. And why do we need com intercultural communication? Because we want healthier communities, because we want increased commerce, because we want reduced conflict, and personal growth through tolerance. These are very important terms, as you may agree with me. Healthy communities, it means working collectively through a healthy intercultural communication process for the benefit of each member of a community, and it helps in understanding, appreciating, and acknowledging the other. 
and increased commerce that is like multinational companies, right? It is only through our capability to handle intercultural communication that we can successfully increase our economic benefits. Reduced conflict. The conflicts due to the misunderstanding and negative generalization can be reduced by cooperative intercultural communication. Personal growth through tolerance, learning from others' values, history, and habits through intercultural communication can help increase our self-awareness. This is quite enriching if we can manage the process successfully. And let's have a look at the uh, concept as an interdisciplinary field. And let's not forget that intercultural communication is an interdisciplinary field of study. The primary academic disciplines and topics related to intercultural communication studies are as follows. We have psychology, linguistics, communication, anthropology, sociology. So these are, you know, very important fields of studies and they are to be considered um, from different angles in intercultural communication. And I'll have a look at the five contexts of intercultural communications very briefly. The first one is the cultural context. It represents a pattern of values, beliefs, and behaviors of certain group of people, either by verbal or nonverbal communication. The second context is the microcultures. They are those separate groups of people coexisting together within a cultural context. The difference could be race, ethnicity, or language. We mean the minority groups or subcultures. The environmental context, it represents the geographical location of cultures. This kind of context indicates specifically when, where, and how one should communicate exactly. The perceptual context, it is to be considered within the environmental context, and it refers to the way an individual perceives the information via their senses. The perception of information is directly affected by culture. Socio-relational context, it uh, refers to the relationship between interactants, uh, and in other words, one interacts, he takes a certain role and function, whether with his friends, family, or professors, professionals. And regarding the complexity of the process of intercultural communication, a fundamental assumption about this process is that the message is sent is not always the message received during intercultural communication. That's why we need the field to be able to study how the message is sent and how the message is received and how we should uh, manage the process of communication. And now I'm going to talk about some fundamental assumptions about intercultural communication. Firstly, when people from different cultures exchange messages, they bring with them a whole range of values and beliefs that are planted by culture. So the message sent is not the message received, as I said before, because of ethnocentrism. Every individual thinks that his own culture is the center of everything. And let's mention ethnocentrism a little bit more. It can be defined as the reasons by virtue of which people each believe. Each people believed it had always occupied the highest point, not only among contemporary peoples and nations, but also in relation to all peoples of the historical past. In a nutshell, ethnocentrism is the feeling and belief that the nation you belong to has a certain superiority over all the others. It means you believe you're the best in all the world. As Sidner, as Sidner puts it, people born into a particular culture that grow up absorbing the values and behaviors of that certain culture will develop a worldview that considers their cultures to be the norm. If people then experience other cultures that have different values and normal behaviors, they will find that the thought patterns appropriate to their birth culture and the meanings their birth culture attached to behaviors are not appropriate for the new cultures. However, since people are accustomed to their bird culture, it can be difficult for them to see the behaviors of people from a different culture from the viewpoint of that culture rather than from their own. As you see, this is a significant concept that may explain today's conflicts. Like everybody thinks they're the best and they don't, uh, they don't try to understand the others and it causes some problems. Secondly, since Intercultural communication is primarily a nonverbal act of people. Edward Hall argues that people from different cultures engage in a selective screening of information that leads to different perceptions of experience. 
So we are try we are kind of selective while uh, receiving the receiving the messages from other people of other cultures. Thirdly, intercultural communication involves a clash of communicator styles. In some societies, people are valued by their speech. In others, silence is preferred and actions speak louder than words. So it all depends on the communicator style. Fourthly, when, whenever people interact with individuals from different cultures, they carry with them certain assumptions and impressions about either the receiver is a black, a woman, an old person. So you have your prejudices and like they kind of stop you from receiving the message as it is. Hence, to be a competent intercultural communicator, one should be skilled in communicating, knowledgeable about how to communicate, and most importantly, motivated for communication. If one of the parties get, gets nervous about communicating with others, the outcome of communication apprehension would be the avoidance of interaction and communication. That means the process would unfortunately stop. So, most importantly, you have to be aware of the fact that this process of communication is intercultural, so it's like among different cultures, and the, manage the process accordingly. And now I'll talk about the founder of the field of studies, that is Edward T. Hall. He's American and he's considered as the father of intercultural communication. He developed the concept of high and low text cultures and wrote many books about the field. He believes that some cultures require high context while others need low context. And I'm going to explain it a little bit. And also, actually, he has uh, two theories, that is context theory, which I'm going to mention today, and time theory, which I won't uh, mention in today's class, because, but you may want to take a look at it, since it is pretty interesting that different cultures perceive the concept of time differently. Coming back to high and low tax cultures, Hall believes that some cultures require high context. And in a high context culture, the listener understands the message without having it spelled out directly. People tend to rely on an elaborate system of many components, such as symbols, body language, intonations of speech, and hidden meanings. People who live in high context cultures also have a tendency to have wide information systems, big families, and extensive friendship networks. As a result, as Edward Hall puts it, they do not need, nor do they expect in their daily life, much in that background information. Most of the information is already present in this person's mind. Hence, their style of communication can be classified as indirect or implicit. The written word is less important than the spoken word. Non-verbal signs are important. Written agreements are not necessarily binding, but oral agreements surely are. And now coming to the low context cultures. In a low context culture, people like clarity and dislike ambiguity. The message itself is the main component that carries meaning. Hence, information and details must be spelled out as context is less important. People from low context cultures tend to categorize their personal relationships, their work, and many other aspects of their daily life separately. Furthermore, they need detailed background information any time they are asked to make a decision. Communication is more formal and explicit. The challenge for international communication is therefore to find the appropriate level of context needed for each situation. Now that you know a little bit about high context and low context cultures, maybe you can decide which is your culture. You know, is it high context or low context? And now. I'm going to the second important man of the field. Uh, it's Gerrit Hofstede. He's a Dutch social psychologist and former IBM employee whose groundbreaking theory of cultural dimensions laid the foundation for future cultural research. And uh, it is, you know, it is interesting to mention that he is a former IBM employee, but you'll see in a minute why I just mentioned that. And with the research he conducted at IBM, he theorized about culture regarding different dimensions. And let me talk about his research first. 
At IBM International, Hoshtayde started working as a management trainer and manager of personnel research and founded and managed the personnel research department. This was his transition from the field of engineering and into psychology. In this role, he played an active role in the introduction and application of employee opinion surveys in over 70 national branches of IBM around the world. He traveled across Europe and the Middle East to interview people and conduct surveys regarding people's behavior in large organizations and how they collaborated. He collected large amounts of data, but due to the pressures of his daily job, was unable to conduct a significant amount of research. When he took a two-year sabbatical from IBM in 1971, he delved deeper into the data he had collected from his job and discovered that there were significant differences between cultures in other organizations, but got the same ranking of answers by country. At the time, the results of the IBM surveys with over 100,000 questionnaires were one of the largest cross-national databases that existed. In original theory, he proposed four dimensions. You see the first four. And along with cultures could be analyzed, that is individualism, collectivism, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, masculinity, femininity. These are the first four. Okay. And then his independent research in Hong Kong left Hoshtede to add a fifth dimension, that is long-term orientation, and later in 2010, he added a sixth dimension, that is indulgence versus restraint or self-restraint. You can see it differently. So first he had four, and then he added the fifth one to cover the aspects of values not discussed in the original paradigm of his, and then he added the sixth one. And now we're going to take a look at them one by one. I'll start with uh, the power distance. and. This dimension studies how societies handle inequality in many areas such as power and wealth. That is to say, to what extent the less powerful members of organizations within a society accept this inequality as normal and possible. According to Ostede's theory, some societies belittle inequalities while others maintain existing inequalities. Doubtlessly, inequality exists in all the societies, yet the degrees differ, differ from one society to the other. And now I'll show you a um, table. Okay, I'll show you the table. We can see the difference between small power distance and large power distance. For example, uh, in a small power distance culture, use of power should be legitimate and is subject to criteria of good and evil. Whereas in a large power distance society, power is a basic fact of society antedating good or evil, its legitimacy is irrelevant. And in a small power distance society, parents treat their children as equals, whereas in a large power distance society, parents teach children obedience. So they teach their children to obey. But in small power distance societies, they teach their children to think like grown-ups. Older people are neither respected nor feared in a small power distance society. And older people are both respected and feared in a large power distance society. Student-centered education is the education type of small power distance society. Whereas in a large power distance society, teacher-centered education is the preferred one. Hierarchy means inequality of roles established for convenience in a small power distance society, whereas hierarchy means existential inequality in a large power distance society. And in small power distance societies, subordinates expect to be consultants. In a large power distance society, subordinates expect to be told up what to do. And pluralist governments based on majority vote and changed peacefully in a small power distance society, whereas in a large power distance society, autocratic governments based on co-optation and changed by revolution are the rulers and preferred ones. In small power distance societies, corruption is rare 
and scandals and political careers. So when there's a scandal in politics, the one who is responsible is uh, expected to resign. But in large partisan societies, corruption is frequent and scandals, scandals are covered up. In a small paradise society, income distribution in society is rather even and, you know, acceptable. And large paradise society, income distribution in society is very uneven. And let's have a look at the last one, that is religions. Religions stressing equality of believers in small paradise societies. And in large paradise societies, religions with a hierarchy of priests. And now that's the first dimension I'd like to mention, like, you cannot say my society is small power distance or large power distance, you know, it may change, it may be rather small power or rather large power, so it doesn't have to be like 100% small power distance, and I hope it is not like that. And let's have a look at the second dimension, it is individualism, but I'll give you some information before we start looking at the chart. This dimension is a bipolar scale, again, like individualism to collectivism, but it doesn't have to be you know, the end, in the end. It describes the relationships an individual has with other individuals in the society. It is directly related to wealth and geographic locations. In individualist society cultures, people's self-interests are rather dominant. Individuals tend to look after themselves as well as their immediate families. They emphasize freedom and ties are, among them are loose. However, members of collective societies usually have close ties. They belong to in-groups, that is like extended families, villages, tribes, cults, and they are supposed to consider the interests of the group, while the group provides protection in return. So group rights, like group uh, requires royalty and gives protection in return. Countries that have collectivist cultures are rather less developed, yet the vast majority of people in the world live in collective societies. And let's have a look at the chart. We have individualism versus collectivism, and individualism, everyone is supposed to take care of himself or herself, and his or her immediate family only, as I said uh, a few minutes ago. And in collectivism, people are born into extended families or clans, which protect them in exchange for royalty. Individualism is like I, whereas in collectivism, we is more important. In individualism, there is the right of privacy. So you have your private space, hopefully. And in collectivism, stress is on belonging. In individualism, speaking one's mind is healthy, so you can give your opinion. In collectivism, harmony should always be maintained. So you give your opinion, but the main part is keeping the harmony. In individualism, others classified us as individuals. So you are an individual yourself, you are I, and then the others are also individuals. But in collectivism, others classified as in-group or out-group. And in individualism, personal opinion expected. So you give your opinion. Uh, one person is one vote. In collectivism, opinions and votes are predetermined by in-group. So your group, the ruler in your group, the leader in your group, it uh, tells you what to do and you do it. In individualism, transgression of norms lead to guilt feelings. In collectivism, transgression of norms lead to shame feelings. In individualism, language in which the word I is indispensable, you, you use it all the time. And in collectivism, it is rather avoided. So you don't need to give your opinion or talk about yourself. You have to consider the group as a whole. And in individualism, purpose of education is learning how to learn. And in collectivism, the education aims to teach you how to do. In individualism, task prevails over relationship. And in collectivism, relationship prevails over task. So your relationship, the, fi the fact that you're in group is more important than your performance. And I'll take a look at the next one that is uncertainty avoidance. And this dimension is to explain the extent to which people feel threatened by ambiguity that is unstructured or unpredictable situations. To deal with such situations, some societies create security and institutions that try to prevent or avoid these institutions, these situations, sorry. 
And let's have a look at our chart again. We have the differences. I'm sorry, just coming back. And we have weak uncertainty avoidance and strong uncertainty avoidance in the other end. The uncertainty inherent in life is accepted and each day is taken as it comes in a weak uncertainty avoidance society. Whereas in a strong uncertainty avoidance culture, the uncertainty inherent in life is felt as a continuous threat that must be fought. So you just avoid uncertainty because you see it as a very uh, strong threat. And in weak uncertainty avoidance, again, is lower stress, self-control, and low anxiety. And in strong uncertainty avoidance, higher stress, emotionality, anxiety, neuroticism, because you're just waiting for the threat to realize, you know. And in weak uncertainty avoidance society, higher scores on subjective health and well-being, whereas in a strong uncertainty avoidance society, lower scores on subjective health and well-being uh, as a natural result of the current situation, you know. And in a weak uncertainty avoidance society, tolerance of deviant persons and ideas, what is different is curious and acceptable. Whereas in a strong uncertainty avoidance society, intolerance of deviant persons and ideas, what is different is simply dangerous. And in a weak uncertainty avoidance society, comfortable with ambiguity and chaos because you take life as it comes. In a strong uncertainty avoidance society, you need for clarity and structure because you're afraid of threats. In a weak uncertainty avoidance society, teachers may say, I don't know if, you, if they don't know something. However, in a strong avoidance society, teachers are supposed to have all the answers. In a weak uncertainty avoidance society, changing jobs, no problem, changing life, no problem. But in a strong uncertainty avoidance society, staying in, in jobs, even if this line. So you uh, don't leave your job, you don't quit because you think there's a threat that is about to happen anytime. So you always stay, you keep your job, even when you don't like it. And weak uncertainty avoidance society, dislike of rules, written or unwritten. You just don't need rules. You think you don't need rules. Whereas in a strong uncertainty avoidance society, there is an emotional need for the rules, even if not obeyed. You want the rules to be there, even when you don't obey. You need them because you have an emotional need for them. And in weak uncertainty avoidance societies, in politics, citizens feel and are seen as competent towards authorities. But in strong uncertainty avoidance society, in politics, citizens feel and are seen as incompetent towards authorities. And the last part, religion, in religion, philosophy and science, relativism and empiricism in weak uncertainty avoidance societies, whereas in strong uncertainty avoidance societies in religion, philosophy and sciences believe in ultimate truths and grand theories. And now the fourth dimension is masculinity versus femininity. And this dimension examines the roles of sexes in a society. It concentrates on sociological aspects rather than biological ones. On the masculine end, dominant values are competition, success, money, and performance, with the male taking more assertive, rational, competitive, and dominant roles. On the other hand, in a feminine society, the most important aspect is basically the relationships. People are concerned about quality of life, they provide support for the underdog and the weak. Men and women are allowed to take the same social roles without conflicts. And let's see. And while we are having a look at these charts, maybe you can uh, tell already that your society, the society you live in, your culture is feminine or masculine, or it's a weak avoidance society or a strong avoidance society. I'm sure you have started deciding already considering the facts about your own culture, because you'll need it for your assignment too. And we have femininity uh, versus masculinity, and in feminine societies, minimum emotional and social role differentiation between the genders. So we don't have basically a differentiation between the genders. They're 
uh, equal in different terms, whereas in masculine societies, maximum emotional and social role differentiation between the genders. So they simply think that women and men are uh, not equals, they're like different, and you know, because it's masculine, uh, you can see the gender that is like, you know, that is considered as the better one. And femininity, and in feminine societies, when and men and women should be modest and caring, in masculine societies, they men should be and women may be assertive and ambitious. So men should be, men is expected to be expected to be uh, ambitious, whereas women may be. And in feminine societies, there's a balance between family and work. In masculine societies, work prevails over family. And in feminine societies, sympathy for the weak, the underdog, as I just mentioned. And in masculine societies, there is the admiration for the strong. In feminine societies, both fathers and mothers deal with the facts and feelings. And in masculine societies, fathers deal with the facts, mothers deal with feelings. And in feminine societies, both boys and girls may cry, but neither should fight. And in masculine societies, girls cry, boys don't. Boys should fight back, girls should not fight. And in feminine societies, mothers decide on number of children. In masculine societies, fathers decide on family size. In feminine societies, many women in elected uh, political positions and in masculine societies, unfortunately, few women in elected political positions. In feminine societies, religion focuses on fellow human beings. And in masculine societies, religious focuses on God or good. Actually, you know, you may uh, oppose it, but as, as, as long as you have a good reason, you may oppose it. I wouldn't agree with it either. And in uh, feminine societies, matter, matter of fact attitudes about sexuality uh, sex is a way of relating, and in masculine societies, sex is a way of performing. And now we're going to the fifth dimension that, it, that is added later in Hong Kong when uh, uh, Hofstede was conducting a research, you know, as, a, in, as an independent researcher. It's a, this is like short-term orientation and long-term orientation, the other end. And I'll give you some very brief info about this. This dimension associates the connection of the past with the current and future actions and challenges. A lower degree of this index, that is short term, indicates that traditions are honored and kept, while steadfastness is valued. Societies with a high degree in this index, that is like long term, views adaptation and circumstantial pragmatic problem solving as a necessity. A poor country that is short-term oriented usually has little to no economic development, while long-term oriented countries continue to develop to a point. And let's see the differences in the cultures. In short-term orientation, most important events in the life occurred in the past or take place now. In long-term orientation, most important events in life will occur in the future. So you see, in short term, it is like past and now, it's current situation. But in long-term orientation, you consider the future. And actually, you, your main consideration is the future. And in short-term orientation cultures, people, steadfastness, and ability, stability, a good person is always the same. In long-term orientation, a good person adopts to the circumstances. So you can change as long as you're good. You don't have to be the same all the time, always. In short-term orientation, there, there are universal guidelines about what is good and evil. In long-term orientation, what is good and evil depends upon the circumstances. In short-term orientation cultures, traditions are sacrosanct, they are sacred. In long-term orientation, traditions are adaptable to the changing circumstances. In short-term orientation, family life is guided by imperatives. And in long-term orientation cultures, family life is guided by shared tasks, values. In short-term orientation, you are supposed to be proud of your country. And in long-term orientation, trying to learn from other cultures is like more important than ethnocentrism. You see, I just mentioned the term. In short-term orientation cultures, 
service to others is an important goal, and in long-term orientation cultures, thrift and perseverance are important goals. In short-term orientation cultures, social spending and consumption is, you know, the main thing. And in long-term orientation cultures, large servings, the savings, sorry, and funds are available for investment. So in one, you tend to consume, spend money. In the other one, you tend to save your money for the future. In short-term orientation cultures, students attribute success and failure to luck. And in short long-term orientation cultures, students attribute success to effort and failure to lack of effort. And basically, like in short-term orientation cultures, if you fail, you it's be, probably because you were unlucky. It's like you had a bad day. You know, there's something happened unexpectedly. But in long-term orientation cultures, you fail because you don't do effort. You don't show effort. And in short-term orientation cultures, show or no economic growth of poor countries. I just mentioned that. And in long-term orientation cultures, fast economic growth of of countries up to a level of prosperity. And we're coming to our last dimension, that is indulgence versus restraint. Let me give you some information before we go on. This dimension is essentially a measure of happiness. It is the sixth and the last dimension added by Hofstede, and it is whether or not simple joys are fulfilled. Indulgence is defined as a society that allows the relatively free gratification of basic and natural human desires related to enjoying life and having fun. Its counterpart is defined as a society that controls gratification of needs and regulates it by means of strict social norms. Indulgent societies believe themselves, believe themselves to be in control of their own life and emotions. Restrained societies believe other factors dictate their life and emotions. And let's have a look at our comparative chart. This is the last comparative chart. And we have indulgence versus restraint in the other hand. And in indulgence, higher percentage of people declaring themselves very happy. In restrained countries, cultures, fewer very happy people. So there are like less happy people. In indulgence countries, uh, societies, a perception of personal life control, so you can control your life, and in restrained culture countries, a perception of helplessness, what happens to me is not my own doing, so it's like, you know, it just happens, I can't control it. In indulgent societies, freedom of speech seen as important. In restrained societies, freedom of speech is not a primary concern. In indulgent societies, higher importance of leisure, and in restrained societies, there is lower importance paid to leisure. In indulgent societies, more likely to remember positive emotions because you're happy. And in restrained societies, less likely to remember positive emotions. So people are uh, have a tendency to uh, remember less positive or let's say it's negative emotions. In indulgent societies, in countries with educated populations, they're like higher birth rates. In restrained societies, in countries with educated populations, lower birth rates. In indulgent societies, most people, people are actively involved in sports. And in restrained societies, people, fewer people are actively involved in sports. Uh, it, it's okay, Ajay, we're just like finishing, but I, I guess you can, you can watch it later. And in indulgent societies, in countries uh, with enough food, higher percentages of obese people. And in restrained countries, in countries with enough food, uh, enough food, fewer obese people there are. And in indulgent societies, in wealthy countries, sexual norms are lenient. And in wealthy countries, countries of restrained societies, stricter sexual norms are present. And the last one. In indulgent societies, maintaining order in the nation is not given a high priority. And in restrained societies, higher number of police officers per 100,000 population. So now, now that you can see the differences very well, I know I've given you a lot of information. I've just like bombarded you with different cultures. So uh, you can have a look at the differences uh, via the videos I've uh, uploaded in our 
first week because we're just done with the dimensions and it's the end of this week's webinar also. And you can have a look at the videos uh, it, there by Hofstede himself. He tells about the differences in different cultures. Uh, th there's one missing in our weeks, uh, in week one's uh, page. It's uh, masculinity versus femininity, but you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube without problems. And if you have questions, please ask me. It was a very like, I, I'm very glad to be here and with you today. And uh, you can ask me why your email or the forum. Uh, I hope to see you this week. Thank you. Uh, Diane?